Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. All right. Well, thank you. I'm glad he didn't mix up the good news and the bad news there. Yes, uh, it's really great to be here with you and faces I recognize and faces I don't. And those that I don't recognize, it's great to meet you. I'm looking forward to meeting you if I haven't had the opportunity to do so. And um, Pastor Dustin and Pastor Beth, what great pastors you have here. And I met Dustin a couple weeks ago. He had lunch together, and he just has such a heart for you, for the church, and more importantly, for Jesus. And so it was encouraging to sit with him. And before we go any farther, let's just stop and pray for them, their family, as they are enjoying some time away. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for for Pastor Dustin, Pastor Beth, and their girls. And as they are traveling about these days, would you surround them? Would you just so envelop them with your love and your goodness, your spirit, which gives strength? Would you give them insight and understanding? And God, would you give them rest? Would you protect them as they are traveling? And um, as they move from place to place and meet, would you also make divine connections for them? Friends, old friends, old contacts, mentors, teachers, givers, those that can pour into their life over the next couple of weeks and that they come back refreshed and ready to move forward with you and with Known Victory Church. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, um, as stated, my name is Jonathan and a couple of my daughters are here with me today who um, were young when they were here But it's interesting, um, you can just, I've been called lots of names in this church. Um, So when uh, when we first started coming here, I wasn't even married, so I became husband, I became dad, I became youth pastor, sort of. Um, Then I became associate pastor, PJ. And then after that time, some people also came up with other names. Some were good, some were fair, some were just names. And um, so this church has been part of me for, I don't know, 20, more than 20 years. Um, So now that I'm through that, just kind of stepping back into that emotional space, of being in the church, the church is awesome, isn't it? The church is, when, when you think about the church and you think we're part of the single most influential, powerful entity that has ever been on the globe. And so on an August long weekend Sunday, when you gather in church, it's not just because, oh, well, we didn't have anything else to do. It's because this is the most dynamic place you could be. Right, and what, and I, I love history, and I love reading through all of the 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 ways that the church has endured. You read about empires and dynasties and world governments, and all through that, the church continues to move, continues to move, continues to overcome and expand, and it's it's amazing. And we sang this morning, even when you don't really feel like it. Honestly, there were Sundays when, well, they're still alive. Sometimes you show up in church, it's like, oh man. I don't really feel like the church is moving. (laughs) It doesn't. Don't let your feelings fool you. The the almighty God, the, the Lord of hosts, never, ever is unattentive to his church. Wherever it is, in whatever corner, whatever capacity, whatever number, whatever space, God is always attentive to his church and he's moving his church forward and there's a purpose and a plan for every part. That means you and I. 
everywhere, always, this morning. Because there's nothing more dynamic, influential, that will ever move on the face of the earth than the body of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, moving towards the culmination of God's plan. And we're in it. Sometimes, sometimes I just need to be reminded, we're, we're in this. Don't ever let the devil fool you and trick you out of your position as a son, a daughter, in the church of Jesus. Incredible. There's no other position you could have that has any comparison to who you are. So I love the church. And I have loved um, ministering and working. And currently, we just have the privilege of attending church as a family. And I still catch myself every once in a while. We get to go to church together. We get to sit together. We get to worship together. And then we get to leave together as well. But it's, it's incredible. And so um, those of you who serve and, and on the worship team and all those kinds of things, I know many of you have done it for years and years and years. And um, God will return to you the blessing and favor of, of his heart as you have served and you'll have, you'll have moments like that as well. All right, so you're in this awesome summer series, which is favorite Bible verses, right? So, uh, summer, what's it called? Play, playlist or something? Favorite Bible verses. Well, I'm going to share a little bit about my favorite. And um, my favorite is whatever God is speaking to me at the moment. So um, the last couple of years, uh, it's been this, and I want to... Sure, it's John chapter 9, verse 25. And uh, the awesome thing about the Word of God is it living, active, dynamic. It's always alive. And so whatever the verse is, God is speaking and His Spirit's in it, and it's alive now, today, in the moment. And then you can read it something later and something in the future. And, past, and it's always living. God can speak. The conversation continues. John chapter 9, verse 25 says this. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Now, let's take a few minutes. I want to read the story, unpack this, explain the significance of it in my life over the last little bit, and hopefully encourage you uh, with being able to make that same statement. Whether he is a sinner or not, he's speaking about Jesus. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. This, the man who's speaking. So John chapter 9. And we're going to read as much of it as we can. Jesus is traveling along. It's just after he's made some pretty radical claims about who he is and what he's about. And um, they just tried to stone him. People have just tried to stone Jesus. And so he's moving along. And uh, it says, as he went along, beginning of chapter 9, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, Jesus, this is an ordinary day after him being trying, tried to be stoned. So as ordinary as that is, as he's moving along, he sees a man born blind. Nothing too remarkable, okay? But I think Jesus kind of made sure that his disciples saw him too, because his disciples stop and say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his father or his parents, that he was born blind? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is, as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Before we get too far, I just want to add some context. The question the disciples ask is not an absurd question. It's not even out of the realm of, of normal. It's just culture. It's just one of the questions as they're walking along. They're trying to form their worldview with their new teacher and understand how things are. So this is a natural question that just kind of comes out of them. Here's a blind guy. There's something wrong with him. He's not who, he's not who he was created to be in the, in the fullness. So, 
the disciples ask a perfectly logical, reasonable question. Who sinned? Either he sinned or his parents sinned. Otherwise, he wouldn't be blind. Cause and effect, consequence, whatever it is. They're just trying to figure out how does the world work? What side of this should we be on? Should we feel sorry for the, the blind man because his parents were sinners? Or should we just continue on, have no regard for him because he's a sinner, that's why he's blind? Which, which side of this do we take? I find over the last number of years that the world I'm in has become polarized, argumentative, choose a side, pick a side. Can you relate? <laughs> Any, anything we do, are you, a, are you a Starbucks or Tim's? Pick a side. There's a godly and an ungodly choice, right? That's an easy one. But, w- but what about the, the real ones, the hard ones that we've dealt with over the last little while? Pick a side. And not just pick a side, let's argue about it. Let's form entrenched opinions about it because we just got to figure out who sinned. What's, what, side are, what side is the right side here? So Jesus makes this statement that I don't think the disciples had any idea what he was talking about. He just said, neither, neither, neither sinned. It's just, and then he continued on. We just got to keep doing the work. And I think the disciples just went, out, whatever, right? I don't think they stopped and unpacked that and figured it all out. And then Jesus does the next logical thing that, of course, he would do, right? After making a statement. Makes perfect sense here. Having said this, he spit on the ground, right? Like, Not only does he spit on the ground, he makes mud out of the spit on the ground, which is gross, right? And then it gets worse. Because after, now hold on. Because, just because this is how my brain works, I was like, how much spit do you need on the ground to make mud? I tried it. You need more than you think to make mud. So when Jesus stopped and spat on the ground, he like was making mud, spitting and making mud, which is not the picture of Jesus that we see on like cards, you know, pictures, things like that. Jesus stops, spits on the ground, makes mud. Then he takes the mud off the ground. The disciples are watching this, okay? And he smears it on the guy's eyes. This has to catch your attention, okay? Because this is bizarre. We, if you've been in church longer than about three weeks, this kind of stuff starts to just be like, oh, that's normal. No, it's not normal. There's nothing normal about that. I have never met or seen anyone spit on the ground, make mud, and put it on someone's face. Hose, playing in the garden, playing in the mud, making mud pies? Maybe. So, Jesus puts mud on this guy's eyes. Tells them to go wash. Now, if the disciples were confused about whose side they were to be on to begin with, who sinned, this, this man or his parents, they had it divided into two sides. But now Jesus has stopped, made mud, put mud on his face, and told them to go wash. Now there's a whole different question about whose side we're on. Right? If you're at rational thinking disciple, you're like, this is weird. Especially because you wouldn't, in in those days, to spit on someone, in Jewish culture, to spit on someone was like a high, highly offensive thing. It was unclean. You had insulted them to a high degree. Even if you spat on the ground. So now the disciples have to be thinking, this is bizarre. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know who sinned now. I think maybe Jesus is the sinner now. Where have you been in situations where you felt like you had to take sides? Come on, just think them through. In the last however many years, last weeks maybe, 
Months for sure. Politics, you picked a side, entrenched your position, argued it, stood on the truth of your political beliefs. What about education? I just finished an education degree and I've been in the schools a handful of times as a sub. Man, you want to take some sides in education. There's some good ones. Pick a side. Um, how about drugs? Safe injection sites. You have an opinion? You have all the truth to back up your position? Got a side, right or wrong? How many of you ever heard the 15 minute city thing? Oh, a couple. Well, it's coming. So you're going to have, you're, there's going to be an argument and there's going to be an opinion. Finances, taxes. I haven't even touched difficult ones like, what about medically assisted dying? What about climate change? We love that one in the church, don't we? Can I tell you that God is in the middle of climate change and has given people on the planet, do you know that we have absolute ability to change the climate? You read about it all the time. Elijah did it. Didn't think that one through, did you? What if Elijah shows up at the king and says, hey king, I'm gonna change the climate for a couple of years. <laughs> And it doesn't rain. And then he shows up again and says, I'm actually going to change it again. People think that they're climate change newbies. No, no, no. We had the first climate change activist. He was good. Which side are you on? You see, this was a legitimate question for them, for the disciples. Who sinned? We just need to figure this one out. It'll help us in our, in our journey. It'll clarify for us this question. If I sin, is something bad going to happen to me or my kids? Or how does this work? Legitimate question. Okay. So he spits on the ground, spits on the, makes mud, puts it on his eyes, and he says, go and, and wash in the pool of Salome. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. I love how the, the Bible just is like, this is an incredible event. The man came home seeing, and they move on. Story moves on. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Some, catch this. Some claimed that he was. His neighbors who had seen him, some are like, yeah, that's the same guy. Others said, no, he only looks like the guy. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Do you see some more division, discussion, conflict, argument? Some say, yeah, that's the guy. Others say, no, no, he only looks like the guy. And the, the one says, yeah, I'm, I'm him. What are the others thinking? No, 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 you're not him because I know who him looks like and you're not him. How then were your eyes opened? Okay, so they're going to argue about who he is. Now they're going to argue about how were your eyes opened. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. And he told me to go to the pool and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? Now, this is the answer I love. The, blind, the formerly blind man says, I don't know. Love it. I don't know. The Pharisees investigate the healing. That's the title of the next part here. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now on the day which Jesus had made the, mud, made the mud and opened the man's eyes, it was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Because that would have been work. Somebody did work on the Sabbath and now he's... So now the Pharisees are thinking, we're not even... We, who cares about whether this guy was blind or received his sight? The real problem here is that he has a sight and it was the Sabbath. Nothing should happen on the Sabbath except coming and putting their offerings into the bucket for the Pharisees, right? He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I watched. He put mud on my eyes is the wrong answer, okay? Because to make mud, the Pharisees would have known work had to be done, right? 
He put mud on my eyes and I washed them and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. (laughs) Now there's a good argument, right? This guy, he probably made it so you could see. He probably healed you. But he's clearly not from God because he didn't keep the Sabbath. How's that for an argument? A position. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Look at how this story, it started with the disciples asking, who sent? Now we have conflict that has escalated, grown. We're not even necessarily talking about the blind man and receiving sight anymore. We're talking about who is he really? Was he really healed? Did Jesus work on the Sabbath? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus a sinner or not? It's just ballooned and grown into this big, long discussion. Now they sent for the man's parents. The parents come in. Is, (laughs) this is, look at this line of questioning. Is this your son? Yes. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he, that now he can see? So they answer, they say, we know he is our son. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll tell you. His parents said this. Now catch this. Because this is a, in, this is a little bit that the, the gospel writer adds so that we understand context. And, and in inspired word of God, this is there for a good reason. Hear what the motivation is here. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus would, was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. This is a position. This is a right or wrong, which side are you on kind of position. So the parents have felt the pressure of the argument and the discussion and the debate and everything, so much so that they're like, we're afraid to really, to really make a statement here. We don't actually know. They start to say, well, we don't know. But they default to a, well, this is the loudest voice. So we're just going to kind of go that way and stay on the side of being able to go to the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned him. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. stop and just kind of unpack that. It starts with the man coming and, and his, his neighbors and his friends, who now he can see. His neighbors and his friends are like, man, this guy can see. And some are, are already like, no, 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 I'm not joining that side. I don't think it's the same guy. Why would you argue that? Why would, why would you even need to take a position that says, Man, this guy was blind and now he can see. And people are are acknowledging this. This guy was blind and now he can see. No, I think that there's something else going on here. I think I know something more than what is being presented. So you have neighbors and others, and they're arguing about whether this is really the guy, whether he was actually blind, whether he was healed. Then Then you have Pharisees brought in, and the Pharisees now want to argue about the Sabbath, whether you should... Anybody should be healed on the Sabbath. Anybody who does work on the Sabbath, are they a sinner or not a sinner? All these things are just, they're, they, they're avalanched into this big debate, discussion. They've sent for, like, this is taking a lot of time now. They've sent for parents, called parents in. Now, These two statements that happen here in verse 24 and 25. 
the Pharisees have now so entrenched themselves in their position, okay? Initially, they're investigating the healing. They're trying to figure out, is this, is this, is this sinner or not? They've entrenched their position. They call the, the formerly blind man for them again, and they say, listen to how they start the statement, because it's, it is, I hear echoes of it in our, in our world, our media, our conversations all the time. They start with this. Give glory to God. If you are really a believer, if you are really a Christian, let's just draw a line here and because we're on the side of glorifying God. Okay, because they bring the man in and they're standing there and they're saying, so we're on the side of giving glory to God. Why don't you come over to our side and give glory to God? Okay, by telling us the truth. They don't say that though. Why don't you come and give glory to God? We know, look at what they say. We know, we know this man is a sinner. Speaking of Jesus. Now, that's a, that's a heavy statement. They are, they are driving a truth stake in saying, we, we know, we know this man is a sinner. Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. I've, I've been in these situations. So have you. Where someone makes a statement and they invoke the glory of God in it too. <laughs> right? Listen, this is God. And, and, and if you're not on this side, you're not on God's side. Really? We know that, fill in the blank. We know so come and, and you, you, you must be on our side on this one. Now, this is why this is my favorite verse. Because this guy answers in probably the most true statement. In this whole conversation, apart from the words of Jesus, this is a, a true statement that this guy is going to say. Everything else, argument, conflict. And he doesn't say, no, you're wrong. He doesn't actually take a side. He does what all of us have the ability to do in Christ. He says, whether or not this man is a sinner, I don't know. Now, not only does that take faith, courage, humility, because we don't like to say that, I don't know, do we? <laughs> Especially when it comes to things that, well, does God do that? I don't know. And as a pastor, man, you'd never say that. <laughs> right? As, some, as an elder in the church, you'd never say that. Well, yeah, you should. We do. So this man says, whether or not he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I can see. There's nothing in that statement that is argumentative. There's nothing in that statement that is debatable. There's nothing in that statement that is untrue. Just a simple, honest statement. Let's read to the end here. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Verse 26, and they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And, and the man answers, I told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now he gets a little, little punchy, hey? I like it. Then they hurled insults at him. You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. Now, I'm thinking Moses didn't want to be brought into this either. But he is. It's not enough that you have all kinds of other people in conflict. Now Moses is like, oh my goodness. Why did you bring me into this, right? We are, <laughs> we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. You see how these, doesn't it just ring with arguments that we hear? We don't even know where he comes from. Yes, you do. You've passed him for years as he sat blind begging. You know exactly where he comes from. You're just making stuff up. 
The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from. Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, look at this. You were steeped in sin at birth. Do you have any question about what their answer was to the initial question? (laughs) Who sinned, this man or his father? So the Pharisees say, you were steeped in sin at birth tipping the hat that they know exactly who this man is, that he was blind, that everything about it. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they throw him out. <laughs> Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When they found him, they said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. The, the blind man still is trying to figure out what's going on. He can see. But he's still trying to figure out what's happening. Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who will see will become blind. Man, more statements that are just a little bit hard to unpack. I want to just touch on this, on these words of Jesus right here. He says, for judgment I have come into the world. Now, we're not going to at all unpack it, really understand. I just want to give a thought on this. Jesus says, for judgment I have come into the world. Why would he choose those words after this account? Who's the only one in this whole story who has enough perspective, knowledge, wisdom to give judgment on what's happened here? There's one character in this whole story, Jesus. So Jesus says, it is for judgment that I've come into the world. Everybody else has a position, has an opinion, has some of the facts as they perceive them to be and are jumping to all kinds of judgments, right? This man is a sinner. This is not the same man born blind. This is not a man of God. This, just go down the list, right? So all these people have positions, opinions, statements, One person has the ability to actually make a judgment. And Jesus says, it's for judgment that I came into the world. I want to tie this with a couple of applications just as we wrap up. When I read this story and consider this this verse... Whether or not he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know. Over the last, it's been, it's been years. As I have walked through and just, let me, let me give you a, a 15 second history. I grew up in church, my dad was a pastor. I heard Bible stories, everything for my whole life. I had all the answers. I was a Bible trivia whiz. I even went to Bible school. I know the right answers. I, know the, I knew the right answers. I knew the right positions. I knew the right sides of the issue to be on. I knew what the Christian statement would be in any given situation. And then you start to realize, huh, well, maybe that's not quite how it was. Maybe that's not quite how it is. I just finished reading a book about Copernicus. Did anybody know who Nicholas Copernicus was? Old guy, old, old guy. Copernicus was the first scientist, astronomer, whoever, who said, maybe the earth isn't the center of the universe. Maybe the sun is. Fascinating story. Because he's also a clergyman. (laughs) And the, the fact, as they were up to that day, was... Of course the earth is the center of it. Just read the Bible. God created the earth and it was the pinnacle of creation. It was in the the middle of creation and, and humanity was on the earth. It is the center of creation. No question, right? How many of you believe that the earth revolves around the sun today? Of course we do, right? The earth revolves around the sun. The sun is the in the center. It's immovable. 
Well, you would have all been burned at the stake had you agreed with Copernicus in his day. Because the prevailing truth in the church was the earth is the center of the universe. Everything moves around the earth. And all of the well-meaning churchgoers would have sat there and been like, that is truth. Anybody who says anything otherwise is a heretic and a liar. And, it, and we would have had a big fight about it. Now today we sit here and go, of course. All the information we have right now says we revolve around the sun. Okay, now just in case we get too smug in ourselves right now. Based on all the information we have right now, we revolve, we revolve around the sun, right? What if, that, what if new evidence presented itself? Or are you thinking, no, there's no way. There's no way that truth could ever change. Careful. Careful, careful. Of course, given what we know right now, that's what we see. But it's changed before, the prevailing truth. So I get to the statement. Whether or not he was a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know. Here's a statement I want you to think about it, wrestle with it, decide whether or not I'm a sinner or not with this statement. We need to stop asking the question, who, who sinned? That's number one. Application number one, stop asking the question, who sinned? You know what? We, we have a definitive answer to that question. Anybody want to answer the question, who sinned? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do we need any more answer to that? No. All we like sheep have gone astray, everyone do it his own way. All have sinned. Okay? Wrong question. Next application is this. As Christians, as, as followers of Jesus, we hold to the fact that we have found the truth, right? That we know the truth. So what is the truth that we've found? Now, if, if you were like me, we started by, by kind of rehearsing some, some Bible statements in our mind, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That Jesus died and was... And those, are, those are true. But I want you to step one more back than that. What is the truth that we anchor to, that we step into as, as Christians? The person of Jesus Christ. Am I right? This is the statement. I want you to hear it. Think about it. What if truth isn't a position or a premise or statement? What if truth is a person? What if truth is Jesus, the Son of God, and that's what truth is? And in finding Jesus, we find truth. And if that's true, then, we, then, then the, the rest of the scripture that talks about being free and the truth setting us free, all, that all makes sense, right? Because if Jesus, if, if truth is a, a person, the person of Jesus, as evidencing the fullness of God, and my relationship and position is with Jesus, then I have stepped into truth. Yes? And I can allow Jesus to make judgment about anything and everything because he can. He has the ability to. And it allows me to step back from all of those decisions and arguments and say, I know Jesus. What's Jesus' position? Because whether or not, fill in the blank, whether or not, should I pick some hot button ones? You know, you know them. I'll, I'll pick one just for fun because it'll catch your attention. Whether or not abortion. I don't know. I have 
strong feelings. But even those strong feelings do not give me the permission to make a truth statement. Give glory to God. We know that. We've seen that before and it didn't go well, right? What I do know is everything Jesus is and says about life, about the gift of life, about the sanctity of life, about protecting life and honoring life. Everything that I step into in Jesus, yes. But for me to stand and make a big statement, this is, we're gonna unravel into arguments. Truth is a person, not a position. Jesus said, I just want to reference this. He said, I will send you the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. Remember in John chapter 15, John chapter 16? I will send you the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. That's what he calls it. And the spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into, what's the rest? All truth. When he, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. He will infill you and he will guide you into all truth. He will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Everything about this is relational, not positional. Truth is relational as I am in relationship with the one who is true, not a position. And as soon as we step outside of that and, be, and begin lining up with positional statements of truth, we are out of the covering, I would say, of God, which is I am in Christ. Be careful, listen, be careful about being right. I have very few things that I know I'm right about. Ready? Here's the list. Short list. I know that I married the right woman. No question. From the moment that I decided this is the one, we're going to spend the rest of it. Now, I know that I married the right one. I don't have to question it. I don't have to wonder. It's a positional statement, true statement. I know won't change. Second on the list, I know I've committed my life to the living God who created me, redeemed me, loved me, and will take care of me. I know. Whether or not, fill in the blank, but I know because I know. Like the, like the blind man. I know I was blind and now I can see. I know what it was like to be without Christ and I know what it was like when I committed my life to Christ. And I know I found the living God. And whatever argument you might want to make will not change that. Because it's true. Last on the list, I know that the Oilers are God's chosen team. And on that trifecta, everything else, I can allow Jesus to lead me. I can allow the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me into truth. And it's really freeing to be like, whether or not, I don't know. But as I follow Jesus, Jesus is going to lead me into truth. In this, in this situation, whatever it is. Why? Because that in itself is true. As I follow Jesus, I am going to move ever increasingly closer to truth. But if I chase the truth over here, I have left the one who's true. I, it's hard. That's why I want you to wrestle with this. Take this and be like, is that right? Because everything about our culture and a lot of our Christianity says, no, you find truth. And the truth, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So you find the position statement of truth and, and you think this is going to set you free. No, it will never set you free. Truth in itself will never set you free. The person who is true will set you free. Only ever. And this. Run your race. Truth is a person. Quit asking who sinned. Truth is a person. 
So you can always be in truth as you are in relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And this, run your race. I love how Jesus addresses this man. Do you know that it would have made a lot more sense in this situation? Because think of all the people that were involved. It would have made a lot more sense for Jesus to show up at the temple and be like, okay, we're just going to settle this once and for all. This is the man. He was blind. Now he can see. You guys are wrong. I am not a sinner. I am the son of God. Wouldn't that have just cleared everything up? But what does he do? And Jesus does this all the time. He goes and finds the man. He goes and finds him and says, has a conversation with him. Do you, do you believe this? Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man says, I don't, I don't know who he is. And Jesus said, well, I'm he. So why don't we have a relationship? Why don't we, because that's how God is. And that's why the man says, I was blind, but now I see. And now his, his identity is in the truth of who Jesus is. Not in the statement of, see, I was proved right. See how that would have been different? Imagine Jesus showed up and just, just dictated, this is the situation. The man who was blind would have been like, yeah, I, guess, I guess that's right. And I'd see, everyone, I was right. And he would have lived the rest of his life being right, and knowing that this Jesus fellow healed him, but maybe never ever being in relationship. So Jesus finds him. That's why I say, run your own race. Jesus will find you. And he'll relate with you. And he will fill you with truth. And he'll fill you with life. Same way he did Peter, right? Remember he finds Peter? After the resurrection, Peter, this is your job. And John, his buddy, is standing there and says, hey, oh no, Peter, Peter says to John, about John, hey, what about this guy? What, what's he going to do? And Jesus tells him to mind his own business. <laughs> One of my favorite stories. Jesus is talking to Peter. Peter's trying to get John's plan. Jesus says, hey, Peter, mind your own business. Same with the Samaritan woman. He finds the Samaritan woman, addresses her. She goes. This is how Jesus. This is how Jesus meets us. So, in closing, just think about this statement and how you could live it in the conflict, and what kind of grace and freedom and life it might bring as you walk into a situation and say, whether or not, fill in the blank. Whether or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. Jesus meets me, talks with me, walks with me. One thing I do know. Jesus said I shouldn't go to that position. I don't know what he said to you, but to me he said don't do that. It's not a license to do what you want, okay? This isn't me saying your truth is truth. No, no, no. Jesus' truth. To pursue and discover Jesus and his truth. So, as I've gone through all of these, these last years and whatever, I have found this statement, actually. As I was sitting in classes in, in education, people say, well, what, what about this and what about this? Well, I don't know. But I do know, and I'd be able to say my own experience, my own testimony. And we were able to overcome some things by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Not a statement of truth. I do know this. Thank you for allowing me to share the word of God with you this morning. It is an awesome privilege to do so. Share the Bible, unpack it. I just want to pray and close. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your spirit with us that guides us and leads us. As we've looked at these things in your word, God, I ask that where there is your spirit of truth in words that have been spoken, would those take root, find, find life, find a place in our hearts, our minds, to instruct and equip and build up and encourage us. Those things that are not true, not of you, would they fall to the ground, become nothing. And God, I pray that your, your presence would continue to rest here at Nolan Victory Church. That you would continue to move and build and equip this body, this part of your body, for the increase of your government and peace that is without end in Edmonton, greater Edmonton, around the world. For each one, that is, this is their home. God, I pray that you would surround them with your favor, with a shield. That you would guard their minds and hearts. You would lead them and guide them into truth. And that their words and their actions would be filled with grace as you are full of grace and truth. And as we go from this place, this beautiful weekend, Jesus, we thank you for our state here, our country, our freedom that we have to meet, to worship, for the sunshine, the water, and the air that we breathe. All things that are so easily taken for granted. As we go, just speak blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.